Well, today uh, we come to the end of this series called The Way Home, and today I want to talk to you, not how to deal with the most difficult people in your life, but how to deal with the most difficult person in your life. Because, you know, we've all got that one person who is the most difficult person in our life to deal with. And when I even say that, it might make, it, uh, make that person's face appear within your mind's eye. As a matter of fact, I have discovered, you're going to find this hard to believe, but even in every church, there are difficult people. Did you know that? You know, they, uh, they carry around those 45-pound Bibles. They're know-it-alls. They have the gift of criticism. They're self-appointed theological watchdogs, and they just give everybody a hard time. You know, they're difficult people in every life. There's not a person that doesn't have somebody that's difficult. You know, it may be that person at work that you have to deal with day after day that you find difficult. It may be that one who has that personality that just grates on your nerves. You ever had one of those? It may be that friend who's hard to get along with and they're very demanding. Or it may be that relative. Don't think of your mother-in-law, but it could be. Or it could be your teenager. Oh, you know how happy teenagers are all the time, right? It could be any one of these difficult people to get along with. Along with. And in every business and in every organization and in every family, there are difficult people. Right now, go back into the archives of your mind. And if you will, just picture the most difficult person. Remember, the most difficult person you've ever dealt with. And don't look at the one sitting beside you, if they happen to be it. And think about that person. And I want you to think about this. The most difficult person, the most defiant and obstinate and rebellious person that you'll ever have to deal with is not them. It's you. You are the most difficult person that you will ever have to deal with. And, and you know, one of the things I've learned, you know, I can deal with difficult people, but dealing with me is hard. I kind of go back to that poem I shared with you a couple of weeks ago by C.T. Studd. He said, only one life, and it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And of all the things in my life, I've got to recognize that I only have this one life in which I'm living. And it's going to soon be passed. I mean, it's amazing how fast the years go. However, I'm glad to be the youngest staffer on stage today. Amen? I couldn't make this really long. Okay. So, you know, if I'm going to, to, to do this, I've got to think about a couple things. What if I were to become really intentional about this only life I've got? Really, really intentional. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm putting things together. What if I decided to, to have the kind of strategic focus that Apple has? I mean, everybody knows Apple, right? Not the kind you eat. But, you know, Apple with our, our, our phones and Apple watches and Apple iPads and Apple computers and all that kind of stuff. You know, every year about August, they're going to unveil something new, right? There's a strategic focus that they have. What if I live with that kind of a strategic focus in my life that I, my life was going to be set on a path and it's going to be set on a journey and I was going to become very, very intentional about everything about me? Think about your life as a boat. You know, we live in, a, in an area that's got a lot of water and there's a lot of boats. And, you know, you look out on the water and you see boats out there on any given day, Right? And there's a certain part of the boat you see. It's the part that's above the water line. But there's another part of that boat that you don't see. It's the boat that the part that is below the water line. You know, above everybody sees, below nobody sees. And if you're going to, to live the kind of life that God wants you to live, you've got to learn to pay attention to the things that are below the surface, below the water line. Now, there's a verse in the New Testament in the, God, in the epistles of John. The, the pastoral epistles. In, in, in 3 John, uh, verse number 2, John says, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you. Well, that's great, isn't it? I pray that all may go well with you and 
that you may be in good health. Well, that's awesome. You know, we all want to be in good health as it goes well with your soul. A couple of implications. You know, I, it does, everything doesn't go well with me, and all my health doesn't go well with me if my soul is not really lined up with the Lord. You know, that's an interesting thing, though, that it goes well with my soul. You know, if we could take some kind of a, of a spiritual uh, measuring device, maybe a stethoscope or a MRI machine or something like that, and, and if we could look at our, our soul, I'm afraid what we might find is there are many of us whose souls are not getting along quite so well. Outwardly, it may appear that everything's fine. We live in a good neighborhood. We've got a nice house. The lawns are well kept. We drive the right kind of car. We dress well. You know, but on the inside, that beneath the waterline level, we're stressed out and burned out and exhausted. As a matter of fact, we can't even remember the last time we really felt joy. And, you know, in my life, the health of my soul is not always really on my radar because I'm thinking about these things that I see immediately. I see a kid that needs to, to be at a certain place at a certain time, and I've got an obligation that's got to be done. And how am I going to manipulate that and besides that and bring it all together so that it happens? You know, we all deal with that, right? Hello, y'all want me to preach a long time? You know, when I got up here, I looked and said, well, it's, tw it's 10 minutes after 11. I've got 20 minutes to deliver. I'm five minutes in. You've got to listen quick. You've got to nod quick and say amen quick. Amen? Okay, you're getting that down. So, you know, we're trying to manipulate all this stuff in my life. And, and most of us have bought into this idea of success uh, being more about, you know, what we do than who we are. You know, we, we, uh, we introduce ourselves and somebody asks us who we are. We tell them what we do. Well, what we do really has nothing to do with who we are. You know, uh, what we do may be on our front side that everybody sees, but who we are is on our back side that nobody sees. And here's the danger with our front side. You know, we can begin to find our, our entire identity in what we do rather than in who we are. But, you know, you've got that backside, that back part of your life that's underneath that waterline. And that's not your public world. It's your private world. It's the backside. It's usually off limits. It's usually dark. It's usually messy. You know, the audience sitting not allowed there. And that backside, that backside, the biblical word for that backside is this word soul. So let me ask you this question. How is it with your soul? God has created you in His image. He's given you a, a, a body. You know the world beneath you, your five senses. He's given you a spirit that you not, might know Him. And He's given you a soul. How is it with your soul? Because you see, your soul is the real you. You know, you can, you can uh, change your outward appearance. You can go get plastic surgery. And you can get hair implants and... Uh, you know, you can get a tummy tuck and you can change your outward appearance. Matter of fact, you can lose your job. You can lose uh, a relative. Uh, you can lose a friend. But your soul is the real you. You're defined by your soul. And the Bible says that one day that you're going to take your last breath. The Bible tells us that our heart's going to beat for one last time. And they're going to pronounce us dead. And they're going to stick this body that we pay so much attention to into the ground. And, and, uh, and there's going to be a, a funeral service, a celebration service perhaps. But we above all people should understand that, that this body is just a container for our soul. It's a temporary housing unit for what, that, what is eternal. So think about this for just a moment. Think about how much effort we put into taking care of this outward body, this uh, above-the-waterline body, this front-stage side of the body that is decaying. Think about how much we put into that. We wash it and shampoo it and wax it and paint it and exercise it, tuck it and comb it. And all of that before 9 a.m. Your soul is the operating system of your life. So this morning, I want to share with you the big number four. The big number four. The four supports or four pillars of a healthy soul. Number one, take personal responsibility. 
That sounds odd, doesn't it? To take personal responsibility. You know, in other words, you've got to own it. Dallas Willard said, Our soul is like a stream of water which gives strength, direction, and harmony to every other area of our lives. Okay, we got that? And, and so, you're getting that quick. You know, God gave it to you. You know, he, he created you in His image. He put a soul inside of this body, and He says, You are the keeper of the stream. You're the keeper of the stream. And so the only way that my stream's going to be pure, the only way that my, my, my life's going to be right is when I move into a, 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 a relationship with God that's based upon repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness. And so this brings us to our text this morning. Did I already tell you all to turn to Deuteronomy? Oh, I'm sorry. I did that in the last service. You should have been here. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And Deuteronomy is a beautiful, beautiful book, and it's a beautiful chapter right here. And here God's talking to His people. He's talking to His people about a healthy soul. He's talking to them about owning things in their life. And He's talking to them specifically about repentance and forgiveness. And He says, and when all these things come upon you. Have you ever had these things come upon you? Have you ever been sitting there in life? And you just felt like all this stuff was coming upon you. All these things come upon you. The blessings and the curse which I've set before you. And you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. And return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey His voice. And all that I command you today with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And He will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. So really what's being talked about here is repenting. It's, it's, it's doing a turnaround in life. You know, we, we run with this frantic pace and, and we say, well, how's it going for you? And you say, not too well. Well, maybe you need to change directions. You know, the... The uh, definition of a fool is that person who does the same thing the same way and expects a different result, right? And so we have to turn from that which we've been doing. And, and when we turn, we turn to God. We turn to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And in turning to God, we find forgiveness. And God says, in finding forgiveness, I give you this choice. It's a choice of life and death. In, in chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Now look, God wants you to live life. He wants you to live with a healthy soul. It's not too hard for you. He's telling us that, right? Uh, and, and neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. The word is very near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart so that you can do it. And God is saying this word of life is very near you. You know, it has nothing to do with your circumstances. It has nothing to do with the house that you live in or the car that you drive or the job that you do. And it has nothing to do with your past. It has nothing to do with, your, with you being a victim, things done to you. And yes, I understand, you know, when things are done to us, it hurts us, and it hurts us deeply. You know, we can be hurt by our past experiences, but we're not held a hostage to our past. Right? I mean, yesterday, you know, Georgia suffered a devastating loss to some team in Tennessee. God forgive you. <laughs> but, and the week before in Alabama, good grief. But you know, it's past, and we move forward, right? Just like we do in football, we've got to do so in life. And if Paul teaches us anything in the entire book of Romans, it te he teaches us this, that the power of the gospel... The good news of Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel, breaks the chains of sin in my life. Amen? The power of the gospel breaks the chains of, uh, of sin in my life. In that uh, new rendition of Amazing Grace, we sing about my chains are gone. I've been set free. I've been set free by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And so, leading yourself well is a good thing. And Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. In other words, you've got to decide today, right? If I'm going to own it, I've got to decide today about repentance. I've got to decide today about receiving the forgiveness of the Lord God Almighty. I've got to decide today about life over death and choosing to walk with Him and go forward with Him. The number two thing in our life is this, though. I've got to identify poisons in my life. You know, don't we all have poisons as we deal with difficult people and our difficult person? In 2 Corinthians, the Scripture says this, Since we have these promises... Promises of God choose life over death, right? Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement or poison of our body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. You know, there are many things that not only contaminate our bodies, but poison that stream of our soul. You know, I've got a, I've got a backpack here with me. I like this backpack. I've had it for a long time. I purchased it at REI in Atlanta many, many years ago before I ever left uh, going on a mission trip. It's, uh, it's made by North Face. Man, that's cool. That's a cool name to have, right? This brand, we recognize it. It was on sale, and I think it was. This is how uncool I am. I don't know if it was on sale because the, the, the model backpack is stitched in upside down and it was supposed to be right side up. I don't know if that's supposed to be or not. But I like this backpack. And I carry a lot of stuff in this backpack. You know, it goes with me. It's been to North Africa. It's been Papua New Guinea. It's been to Ukraine. It's been over, over Holland and in England and across the United States. And, and this backpack goes with me. And everybody in this room carries a backpack with them as well. And you know what I found as well? You don't know what I've got in this backpack, do you? Well, I carry some travel goodies. I mean, it's important to have goodies. And, and you know, I've got a, well, I've got a cloth there to, to clean my sunglasses with. They can get messy. I've got a bandana. You never know when you're going to need a bandana, really. Oh, and, and here's one of the most important things you can carry in a backpack when you're going to weird places and eating strange food. I've got Tums. Oh, Yeah. Man, I was grateful for Tums one time in North Africa, the first time I ate pigeon pie. It was actually good. <laughs> but man, I knew about it all night long. And I think into the next day. So I've got these things that I, that I carry around in my backpack, just like you've got things you know, that you carry around in your backpack, and you've got this uh, backpack, and everything that's inside it's invisible to me. It's invisible to everybody else, but you remember what's packed there. And, 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 you know, what happens is we carry these backpacks around, and there's things in there that are heavy, and they weigh us down. They, they rob us of joy. They rob us of joy. And, and you know, um, some of the things we work for, you know, like the applause of other people can rob us of joy. That can be part of the stuff we carry. And, 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 you know, like the, the applause of, of people in your life, it'll wreck your life. It'll mess you up. Like working hard. Working hard's good, but, but becoming a workaholic will, will mess up your soul. It'll, it'll pollute you and, and mess you up. Ambition is great until, uh, you know, it's a, as long as it's a quality governed by the Holy Spirit. And being good with, uh, with people is a great quality until you begin to live for their approval. And so there's two kinds of poison. We have environmental poisons that can pollute our soul. Well, what are those? You know, they swirl around us in our culture. Materialism. Man, we live in a culture of materialism and consumerism. We want the newest, the biggest, the brightest, the coolest, the fastest. All that kind of stuff. And, uh, and our pace of life. And the very fact that we're plugged in. How many of you in the room have your cell phone with you this morning? Let's pull out our, our cell phones. 
Everybody pull out your cell phone. Turn it on. Turn off the lights. Turn off the room lights. Okay, let's wave it. Oh, wow! Man, we're at a concert and I'm a rock star. Right? And look at this. We are connected. We're connected. Yeah, I mean, I don't have my ringer on. You can turn the house lights back on now. I don't have my ringer on, but if I get a buzz, you're going to know it. I'll, I'll be jumping, right? Because it's in my back pocket. Man, we, we're overly connected. We're plugged in uh, to all the technology. And you don't get con- to control those, but you get to uh, better learn how to, to manage them in the world in which we live. Then there's those internal kinds of things. It's our shadow side. You know, we've been Christians for a long time. You know, uh, we've hung around the church most all of our lives. We know a lot about the Bible. We give money to the church. We even serve in ministry, but oftentimes we're angry. We're unloving. We're super critical. And basically we're insecure. And so oftentimes, you know, when we become followers of Jesus Christ, we learn a little bit about the Bible and and we modify our behavior, but some of the deeply broken stuff, you know, really isn't addressed. You know, like, how do I manage my anger? How do I, uh, you know, control, uh, deal with my control issues and my addictive behavior and the wounds from my family of origin and, and the pain and the scars that, that some of us bear because of things that have happened in our past and, and in our growing up years and in our family and in this backpack, we're carrying this load. And this load begins to get heavy. Now, you might find this strange, but this backpack is heavier than it looks. As a matter of fact, if I drop it, you'll recognize how heavy it is. Why? Because in this backpack, I've got this brick I carry, and it's not very efficient for me to carry it. You know, when I go on a mission trip, it's not efficient for me to carry it when I stand to preach. It's not efficient because this brick is a load, and it represents Something that every single one of us deal with. You know what it is? Shame. You know, I've got a history. You got a history. We all have a history. As a matter of fact, we don't only have things in our history, but we've got things that go on in our mind even right now. And we think, if they only knew what I was, they wouldn't be accepting of me. You know, I deal with it. I was talking with someone a while back in, in counseling. I said, well, Pastor, I just don't feel like I can come to church right now because I'm just, I just feel like I'm a big hypocrite. Hello, can we all identify with that? How many of you feel like a big hypocrite most of the time? Or part of the time or some of the time. We all feel like a big hypocrite. Sometimes I go to a pastor's meeting and I sit and I listen to these guys. And and man, they're thinkers and they're they're pushing and they're doing. And they've got all this stuff going on. They've got all these great brainstorms of an idea. And, 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 uh, you know, sometimes I feel like a dud around that bunch. And kind of shamed. Right? Don't we all deal with that? And what I have to recognize is, wait a minute, you know, God's doing a work in my life. And, and what I have to reckon is, recognize is God uses the broken places in my life as He's prepared me for what He has prepared for me. And, and emotionally healthy people build, you know, they hold in tandem two realities. The reality is that we're deeply broken, yes. We don't measure up to each other. We're not supposed to measure up to each other. We're only supposed to measure up to the calling that Christ has in our life. But we're unbelievably blessed as well. Can you identify, I am blessed? I am blessed. Hello, amen? I am blessed. Everybody's blessed. Hold your hand up. Let's get in on this. I'm three minutes over time. I've got to begin to wrap it up, and I'm just hitting number three. The third pillar is this, in life, this is what you've got to do then. You've got to create space and slow down. You know, slowing down is hard because, uh, you know, when we do that, we have that opportunity to look into ourselves. I was talking to a guy the other day, and he says, you know, Pastor, I- I've disconnected. I've unplugged the TV. I've turned off the cell phone. I don't have the iPad. I've dis- Wouldn't that be awesome? 
Remember what life is like? I mean, how many of you grew up and you were the remote control for the house? Remember that? Now we can't sit through a commercial because we can flip. I hate sitting through commercials. We can flip. But to be unplugged. There's an entire television show about that life unplugged or something like that. You know, we need to learn to do that. And, 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 and it's hard for us to because, you know, we run around uh, like some of those cars did a few years ago on the California Expressways with a stuck accelerator. Isn't that the way we run around? Man, we are wide open all the time. Yesterday was awesome. We didn't have to be anywhere really early yesterday. Just had to, you know, be out somewhere at 8.30 with Elena to do a service project for school and, and such. But it, it felt like a relaxing day for a change. That was great. Don't, don't you love Saturdays like that? It was a beautiful, beautiful day. And, 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 you know, we tend to have this love-hate relationship with busyness. You know, we hate it. And we hate the hassle and the stress and the overcrowded schedule, but we love it because we're in demand and, and people that are busy are important, right? We all want to be important. And the quality of our life has everything to do really with the space that we build into our life. God didn't create us to run 24-7. He created us to have a Sabbath's rest. You can't follow the Lord Jesus Christ in a sprint because if you do... Live that kind of a life that'll warp. The, uh, if you live a life at warp speed, it'll warp your soul. So the friends of a of a healthy spiritual life are space and and slow. I mean that sounds kind of weird, but Jesus modeled space and slow. In Mark chapter one, the Lord Jesus is in this little city called Capernaum. So think about his day. It's a Sabbath. It's a busy day, right? It's an emotionally intense day. And he's asked to be the guest rabbi to preach there at the local synagogue. So he preaches. All the people gathered in. During his sermon, he's going along and he's, he's confronted by a demon-possessed man. Now that would be intense, right? You know, if some guy came running in here frothing at the mouth and hair all wild and crazy, screaming and shouting, running down the aisle, wouldn't that be kind of intense right now? I mean, that's what's going on here at the synagogue while Jesus is preaching. And, and, and then the Bible says that right after church, he leaves the synagogue and he goes to Peter's house. I can imagine that. I've been the guest preacher at a, at a church before. and We've left the church and we've gone to somebody's house for Sunday lunch. And, and if you're Jesus, I'm sure you never really get to relax. You know, you're always asked questions and always asked to say the blessing at the meal. Why is Jesus? And while he's there at Peter's house, they present to him Peter's mother-in-law, who's sick, and he heals her. And then the Bible says, before bed that night, they brought everybody in town who was sick and demon-possessed to his door. And it says, before he slept, uh, he healed many more, and he cast out many more demons. Jesus has an intense day. I can identify with that after I've preached twice on Sunday morning and met and greeted and smiled and shook hands and had coffee and prayed and, and sang and been recognized and all that kind of stuff. You know, when I get to lunch today, you know, when I sit down in that chair at lunch, I'm going to feel tired. And after I eat lunch, I, I'm going to feel like I'm about to pass out till I can get home and take a short nap. It happens every Sunday, Right? The intensity of Jesus' day. And so, read it a little further in the Bible. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. The scripture says, this is on the next day, right? Rising early in the morning, while it's still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. He went to a desolate place. The Lord Jesus Christ unplugged. Man, we have a hard time doing it. I walk the dog every morning at 530 it's dark. It's not even my dumb dog. <laughs> Would you believe I walk out the door with cell phone in hand? Because I have to call my younger daughter to make sure she's awake at no later than five minutes to six. Can't even walk the stupid dog without being connected. Hello, does anybody, 
Anybody like that? We've got, we've got no space in our life. We've got no slow in our life. And, and, and what the Bible tells us, you know, really what's implicit is Jesus pulled away and that's where he clearly gets his next steps from the Father. And so we need to learn to live with a principle of rhythm. Everything in the universe is designed with rhythm. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. Everything's with rhythm. And God says, I want you to work, but I want you to rest. He says, I want you to produce, but I want you to restore. Everything in the universe has rhythm. You know, you breathe with rhythm, your heart beats with rhythm, the tide rolls in with rhythm, music is built around rhythm. Even in Leviticus 25, God says, every seven years, I want you to give the, the, the earth a rest. Look at that verse. On the seventh year, you'll give it a Sabbath. And not sow your field or prune your vineyard. And so God gives us this great gift in saying, every seven days I want you to have a day that's not about work, that's not about being productive, that's not about you doing something, but you can just be and rest and relax and enjoy me and enjoy what I made. Get alone, get unplugged, and get with God. And then number four, integrate into your life authentic spiritual disciplines. Jesus said this is the most important thing in all of life. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. What do I mean by authentic spiritual disciplines? I'm not talking about being religious. Religious is about coming and going to a meeting. Religious is, you know, thinking that you've got to have Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night services or you're not doing church. That's religious. Spiritual disciplines are going slow and building space in your life so as to have authentic time with the Lord God who's made you, who's created you. You know, one of the painful lessons I've learned as a pastor, what I learned as a seminary student is this, is, you know, I've got to let my, you know, I cannot let my work for God replace my space and my slow pace with God. You know, when, I'm in, when I was in seminary, I remember this very vividly, you know. I was, I was thinking, well, God, you know, I don't have time to, to have another specified quiet time. I mean, I, I am in the study of the Pauline epistles, and I'm, I'm going through New Testament Greek, and, and I'm, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm studying the book of Isaiah, and, and all this work was allowed so as to replace the quiet time. And this is the way we can feel in our church life. We can, we can feel like this. Well, well, God, I'm busy. I'm singing in the choir. I'm serving in a wanna. I'm playing an instrument. I, 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 I'm an usher. I, I volunteer in the nursery. I'm preparing food. I'm bringing, I'm bringing, what's the candy flavor of the year this year for trunk or treat? What's your favorite, Dan? Snickers. Snickers. Okay. Dan wants Snickers. What, what flavor do you want, Sean? Twix. Twix. Matt. Baby Ruth. So that's what to bring, you know, and they'll break in the bag. No. And you're doing all that stuff, right? That is not authentic spiritual discipline. But, I mean, it's good stuff. It's ambitious stuff. It's busy stuff. We need you to do it kind of stuff. But it doesn't equate with getting slow and building space and being unplugged in order to have time, quality time with the Father. See, Jesus said something. Jesus said, I am the vine and you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Jesus is the gift. And you're the box. I mean, I, I brought something else today too. I brought a gift box. And I want you to think about what's inside the box. Inside the box is the gift of Jesus. Outside the box 
is me, it's you. And so oftentimes, you know, we get concerned about the box itself, right? Like the other day when I asked my assistant, Linda, I said, Linda, I need a, I need a, a box wrap with, uh, with gift wrap. Well, she immediately became concerned about, well, what size box? I don't care, whatever you find. A shoe box? Yes, that's fine. She says, well, how do you want it wrapped? Do you want it wrapped with, and I, I know I'm picking on her. She can raise your hand so y'all can know. But, you know, she wanted to know, you know, uh, what do you want, Christmas wrap? Or, well, I said, I don't care what kind of wrap. Then she brings the wrap, right? Brings it in wrapped. It's wrapped in purple. Well, I'm sorry it's wrapped in purple. That's what we had. Now, you don't have to like that bow. You don't have to keep that bow. You know, you can get rid of the bow. I mean, it's okay. Right? But what I want to demonstrate is this. Isn't this what we get concerned about? We get concerned about what... You know, what we see, what we identify, what I do, where I go, all that kind of stuff when we talk about spiritual relationship. Well, singing in the choir has nothing to do with your spiritual relationship. It may be an expression of, but it really has nothing to do with the fundamental connection with the Lord. And I don't mean to be picking on the choir. Preaching on Sunday morning has nothing to do with your spiritual relationship. It's more, you know, the box. What's important is the gift that's inside the box, and the gift inside the box is Jesus. Jesus in you, your life is the box. Jesus in your heart is the gift. Jesus in, uh, uh, in invigorating and bringing life to your spirit is the gift. So you don't have to carry around a brick of shame because you've been given a gift of grace. And God's doing this work in your life. And, and, and so, here's a, here's a principle. Take your eyes off the bigger and the better and put it on the, the deeper and the closer and stay completely connected to Jesus Christ. Because you see, one day the, the trappings of your career will fade away. And you know what? You'll resign your position. And there'll be another nameplate put on your desk. And your business cards will be in the trash. They'll give your computer to somebody else. Someone younger and brighter and skinnier and with hair that's going to take your position. But listen, if I've been making it about Jesus, it's going to be more than okay. It's going to be awesome. Because look at verse 20 of our text. Deuteronomy 30, verse 20 really an important verse because I didn't get to I didn't have time to do the complete exposition on this that I really wanted to do right loving the Lord your God obeying his voice and holding fast to him okay for he is your life and he is your length of days that you may dwell in the land of the Lord Jesus is your life he's the gift you're the box he wants to be in your box. He may be speaking to you this morning, His Spirit saying, invite me in. Remember that very first step, take ownership and own it, repent and forgive, <laughs> and find forgiveness. Remember that? That's what you got to do. Some of you today, you know God speaking, this is the church family you need to be a part of. Come on, we're fixing to have a time of decision. You know, whatever that need may be in your life, Jesus is your life, and this church wants to be a part of it. This pastor wants to be a part of it. I personally invite you to receive Christ Jesus. I personally invite you to become a part of this church family, to take a step of obedience and baptism or service or something as we sing this song of decision. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and for your tender mercies. And Father, we pray that in all that we do right now, that it will honor you, that we'll glorify your name. And Father, that uh, you will have uh, many, many hearts and souls placed in this time and in this hour and in this valley of decision. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.